This video is brought to you by Keeps. Hey Wisecrack, Michael here, obviously. Today we're here to unpack the film with the absolute grossest sound design. The Platform. The sleeper hit, which premiered in 2019 and came to Netflix in 2020, intrigued a lot of people as they slipped into their own personal socially distanced hell. The film seems made for Wisecrack. A simple, gross premise as political allegory is basically as irresistible to us as an all-you-can-eat taco buffet. But I wouldn't be here if there wasn't something bothering me about this film. Specifically, is it as smart as it thinks it is? Well, let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on the platform. Is it deep or dumb? And spoilers ahead. But before we continue, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. I love wearing hats. They're pretty much part of my identity. You probably feel the same way about your hair. It's something people recognize, and it's probably one way you express yourself. If you've ever been scared of losing it, then Keeps can put your mind at ease. Keeps is an affordable hair loss treatment program that provides FDA-approved prescription and over-the-counter medication. With Keeps, there's no trip to the doctor or awkward pharmacy pickup involved. You can do everything right from the comfort of your own home. You meet with a doctor virtually and can get the medication delivered delivered right to your door. Keeping your hair is all about prevention, so the sooner you take action, the more hair you can save. With Keeps, some men even report hair regrowth. Find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and why nearly 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication by clicking the link in the description or by going to keeps.com slash wisecrack. If you use our link, you can get 50% off your first order. Stop stressing and keep your hair. Now, back to the show. The platform follows the young idealist Goreng in a vertical self-management center, which is bureaucratic speak for a food-themed purge prison. Inside the concrete walls, anything goes. Well, almost anything. Prisoners are free to be as gluttonous as possible, shit on their fellow inmates, murder them, eat them, or do none of the above and just chill out with a good book. While all of this is happening, prisoners are served food once a day through a floating dumbwaiter containing elegant, even decadent dishes. As the dumbwaiter makes its way through each of the levels of the very tall prison, the tasty feast is quickly consumed and defiled by the prisoners closest to the top, until nothing is left for the prisoners below. The basic message of the film doesn't need a wisecrack breakdown to decode it. The prison allegedly makes enough food to feed everyone, but the greed of those at the top condemns those at the bottom to die from starvation. Get it? It's capitalism. Now, if the film were just this, it'd get a big old dumb from us. Believe it or not, pay Nicolas Cage to look into a camera and whisper, the only thing you have to lose is your chains, is not enough for a wisecrack deep certification. Nor does having a guy that kinda looks like Jesus at times, or a 333 story building with two prisoners per floor, which means there are 666 people. But there is more to this film than that, right? We're going to focus on a couple of things here. The symbolism, the use of Don Quixote, and last but not least, the oh-so-confusing ending. So let's start with the symbolism. As director Galder Gastelu Yuratia has stated, the film is not a social critique, but a social self-criticism. In other words, it doesn't just take shots at those in power, but regular old folks like us, the viewer. Goren, the idealist, and Trimagasi, the cynic, represent two sides of our consciousness. Like Trimagasi, we are self-concerned realists. Hey, los de abajo, me oís? Llame a los de abajo. ¿Por qué? Porque están abajo. But like Goren, we like to pretend we're above such selfishness. This seems to relate to the basic idea that in a hyper-competitive society, we all run the risk of acting like cannibalistic monsters. As Gaztalu Urtia argues, perhaps there are individuals who would give up their position voluntarily to achieve a more egalitarian society. However, for the group that should give in, that's very difficult to collectively agree on. We are all selfish, but there are some among us who are very selfish. The latter, the most selfish, light the fuse, and the fire of selfishness spreads easily among the others. Now, we could sit here and decode little details. Uh, for example, the woman who sent Goren to the prison has no idea what the prison is like. An allegory for how those who manage society have no idea about the basic conditions they're condemning others to face. Or how the delicate, artful presentation of the food is meant to represent our obsession with all the luxury capitalism produces, while what's left for the vast majority of the world's population is abject poverty. But we're not the first to even mention this, so let's move on to the good books. And specifically, Goren's new favorite book, Don Quixote. 
With the help of arguably the world's first modern novel, we can better understand this symbolism and a whole lot more. Goren, like all prisoners in the film, gets to bring one item. But rather than bringing a gun or a crate of vitamins like a smart person, he brings Miguel de Cervantes, the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. Now, most people recall Don Quixote as the story of a delusional man who gets into fights with windmills thinking they're giants. And while that is important, some of the basic overarching themes of the novel can actually help us understand what the film is trying to say. Alonso Quijano, alias Don Quixote, is an elderly Spanish nobleman who reads so many books that his brain begins to rot. Specifically, he reads tales of chivalry, becomes obsessed with a nobler lost past, and ventures out on a delusional journey as a knight errant. He sets out to rescue a rando peasant who he deems a damsel in distress and randomly names her Dulcinea, because why not? He also fights windmills thinking they're giants and declares his squire, Sancho Panza, governor of some island. Now, one clear parallel to these delusional journeys is Maharu, a woman who once a month kills her cellmate and goes on a quest. Maharu isn't in search of chivalry, but a child who we're told doesn't actually exist, except that child is real, allegedly, but I digress. In the film, it's unclear what the hell is going on in society that leads Garen to voluntarily send himself to prison to earn a degree. But that's exactly what happens, and he hopes to quit smoking and to read Don Quixote along the way. We don't know a whole lot about Garen's literary habits otherwise, but he starts off his journey, like Don Quixote, as an idealist. But rather than chasing delusional visions of fighting monsters and saving damsels in distress, he's motivated by the delusion that basic human goodness and decency can prevail in a trash castle like the Hole. But as the film progresses, he's slowly stripped of these illusions. After trying to get others to cooperate by eating reasonable portions, he is promptly accused of being a communist Usted comunista. and watches his cellmate piss on the prisoners below them. Like Don Quixote, Goren also loses his mind in a more literal sense vis-a-vis -vis trippy hallucinations. But instead of ideas of chivalry, he's haunted by reminders of the horrible things he's done and witnessed in the prison. After co-murdering and eating his first cellmate, Goren scores a spot on a higher level of the prison. Here, he returns to his former ideas of nobleness and human decency. This time, though, he does so with the awareness that spontaneous solidarity, as his new cellmate describes, is a sham. The only way to make his fellow prisoners more generous to those below them is to literally threaten them with sh**. After going back down, eating another roommate, but this time with no murder, and once again landing a spot on a higher floor, Garen enters a second kind of quixotic journey. He meets his own Sancho Panza, Baharat, and they decide to go on a quest to the bottom of the prison. Their mission is first to feed everyone, but then they get another idea in their head. To deliver a message to the administration. We're not the animals you think we are. By violently enforcing a portion control and preserving a single panna cotta dish, they will prove the nobility of their spirit to the people in charge of the prison. La panna cotta es el mensaje. Of course, the sense of nobility, much like Don Quixote's, is quickly undercut as a montage of skull bashing ensues. So, pretty deep, but that gets us to the end, which is kind of a giant WTF. But a brief note on Don Quixote will help us understand this puzzling finale, which kicks off when Garen and Baharat find Miharu's wasn't supposed to exist child at the bottom of the prison. After some hesitancy, they decide to feed her their prized dessert, which is to say, all their skull bashing was maybe for nothing. Garen and Baharat's obsessive mantra that the panna cotta is the message changes. Garen wakes up from a dream realizing the girl is the message, and he descends with her to the dark depths of the prison. The ghost of Trimagasi paraphrases a Don Quixote passage in which the goofy knight remarks to Sancho about how intertwined their fates are. Juntos salimos y juntos peregrinamos. Una misma suerte y una misma fortuna correrá para los dos. Garen sends her back up to the top of the platform while walking into the shadows of Trimagasi. He is presumably very much dead, but on the bright side, he has quit smoking. Here's what matters. In Don Quixote, the protagonist eventually gives up his delusion, renouncing chivalry and dying in a fevered state. One way to read the finale is this. Goren has also given up his delusions of nobility, or more specifically, that he can prove his humanity to the administration by sending them back their treasured panna cotta. Instead, he opts for another message. It's you who are the real monsters, and here's the proof. A child whom those in charge claimed would never be confined in their hellhole. 
The takeaway of the film seems to be this. Oftentimes, oppressed folks try to prove their own humanity to their oppressors. However, perhaps their strategy should actually be to prove the inhumanity of their oppressors. And it's a, a nice thought. Thought-provoking. Definitely. So is the film deep or dumb? On the literary symbolism, it's pretty deep. The filmmaker uses the themes of Don Quixote in a novel and thoughtful way. But, and I'm sorry, I can't stop from thinking that lots about this movie is kind of dumb, with apologies to the director. Chatting with the Wisecrack crew, there was the general sense that this movie was too on the nose, which is to say, a little bit too precisely resembling something I could probably read on Twitter. For most of the film, the message is, if we could all stop being greedy, there'd be enough food for everyone. It's not that I disagree with the message, but it's hardly a revelation. If I can give a more theoretical framework, on the noseness is to social commentary what fan service is to franchise movies. Moments, characters, and dialogue that are meant to have us nod along and say, ah yes, this speaks to me. In Star Wars, it's seen a recycled Han Solo line spark a sense of nostalgia without any of the narrative weight of the original. More broadly in media, it's when old ideas are recycled to spark a sense of agreement without any of the provocation that idea once originally had. I'm sure the first person who said sharing is caring was really smart, but your kindergarten teacher is no Dostoevsky for saying so. It's not that this makes those ideas inherently good or bad, but good art furthers the conversation instead of putting it on a loop. Consider a film like Snowpiercer, which also takes a horrible stratified society as a given. But rather than the lower classes overthrowing their cruel overlords and cheering, Bong Joon-ho makes us ask really hard questions like, does the system secretly want revolt? Is society designed to make suffering inevitable? It also shows us the logic of those in power. Tilda Swinton's character is certifiably bonkers, but seems to be a real believer with her own fears. And the conductor that keeps the nightmare chugging along has his own very logical reasons for being a monster. He truly thinks it's the only way for humanity to survive. And to the platform's credit, I do think the ending kind of gets to this. But if the message really is, show the people in power what monsters they are, it's hard to do since they barely have any screen time. Does it work? Are they swayed? It's obviously meant to be ambiguous, and revealing the answer would have been totally weird given the prior absence. But as far as the basic idea, if 2020 has taught me anything, it's that oftentimes reality doesn't dictate political discourse. So my final assessment. There are certainly some smarts to this movie, but it's no masterpiece. But it tried, and for that the cast, crew, and director deserve all the panicatas their hearts desire. And I'm legitimately excited to see what Galder Gastelu Yuratia plans on doing next. What do you think? Are we just too crotchety that not everybody is Bong Joon-ho or Nicolas Cage at this point? Let us know what you think in the comments. A huge thanks to our amazing patrons for supporting the channel. Hit that subscribe button like it's an unruly cannibalistic cellmate, and as always, thanks for watching. Later.